see similes of school everywhere. For instance, if I'm at the grocery store and I'm reaching up high and I'm trying to get a roll of paper towel down from a high shelf without knocking everything down, I think of times in the classroom when a student makes a particularly interesting comment and I want to draw it out without sending the whole lesson tumbling. Or maybe I'm at the post office in a long line, waiting and waiting, moving slowly along, and I think of learning a new language and inching my way slowly through unfamiliar nouns and verbs until at last I'm called up to the window only to be asked to step aside and fill out a little form, but that's okay because then I get to come back to the front of the line. And so the similes go on and on, and sometimes they don't quite work, but that's part of the fun. So when preparing this talk uh, today, I, I thought about how talks of this kind resemble the classroom. In both situations, you're supposed to give your audience or your students something they can understand and use right away, a takeaway. That's the subject of my talk, the takeaway and what it takes away from education and culture. I'm here to protest the takeaway, including the possible, possible takeaway of this sentence. <laughs> Our schools and culture glorify the takeaway, the pocketable answer, the successful transaction, the surety squeezed from things unsure. We're expected to get to the point right away and go no farther. People limit not only what they say, but how they think. There's little room for doubt or expanse, and great pressure to reduce ideas to a talking point, a power pitch. The problem is not with the conciseness, conciseness is good, but the glib confidence, the hyper-marketing, and the, the briefcase this filled with shining talking points. And I'll explain a little how this plays out in education. In school districts around the country, teachers are expected to structure their lesson around an objective that is aligned with the standards, displayed prominently on the board, and rehearsed at the beginning and end of a lesson. And sometimes even the students are asked to recite the objective together. Okay, now, it's good to have an objective. Lessons should accomplish something. The problem lies in the confinement to the objective, treating the obje objective as the ultimate end goal. No, no subject matter stays still. It's constantly pushing outward to new and old questions. So take, for example, an algebra lesson. Now, for those who say, oh, math, 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 I'm scared of math, do not worry, just follow along. It's the gesture that, that uh, matters right here today. So imagine in an eighth grade algebra lesson, students are learning the algebraic equation, basic and very important that a squared minus b squared equals a plus b times a minus b. Now, it's not difficult to see that this is the case. You apply the distributive property, and you could have a lesson based on that and possibly another equation, and the students would walk out with the compact assurance that yes, this is true. A squared minus B squared equals A plus B times A minus B. But why stop at that? There's something really interesting that you can do here. Okay, look at, imagine a triangle. I mean, not a triangle yet, a rectangle. And imagine uh, challenging students to recognize that any rectangle can be seen as having sides A plus B and A minus B, where A is the average of the length of the two sides, and you find the average by aligning them like this, splitting the difference, and boom, look, you have A and you have B. And you can see that this length is A plus B, and you can see that this here is A minus B, because this here is B. And then, so what do you know? You know that the area of this rectangle, whatever the rectangle is, is A squared minus B squared. Great, but why stop even at that? Now, guess what we can do? We can find, without taking any numerical measurements, we can actually find out, we can find the, the square that has the same area as this rectangle, just by folding paper again and applying the Pythagorean theorem. So now, moving ahead, we have the A plus B. Okay, so now take our A. So we know that for the Pythagorean theorem, we know that the sum of the squares of the two sides, the length of the two sides equals the square of the hypotenuse. So let's make our hypotenuse A, and let's have our base be B, and then we have A squared minus B squared, which is the area of this rectangle, equals C squared, and C then will be the length of the square, the side of the square, whose area is equal to the area of this rectangle. So it's beautiful, how do we do this? So we take another sheet of paper and we make B the base like this, and then all we do is take our A that we've already found and we make it our hypotenuse by attaching it here and here and bringing it up to the edge of the paper 
And right here we have our triangle and we make a little mark here. And this is going to be our C. And if we measure it, we will find that yes, indeed, it has the same area as this rectangle as a whole. This taken as a square, which will extend outward a little bit, has the same area. And so without taking numerical measurements, we found that square that had the same area as the rectangle for any rectangle. And so mathematics becomes a way of seeing in the dark. But if a teacher brought this up at the end of the lesson, she would receive a less than stellar rating for departing from the objective. Instead, she's supposed to have the students finish up with an exit ticket, which is a short task that demonstrates that they've learned what they were supposed to learn. And there's nothing wrong with reinforcement. There's nothing wrong with practice. But the problem is with the delusion that the subject can be wrapped up like that. It's continually pushing on. And students should recognize that. They should realize you know, when they've learned something that you can take that farther, that you can then ask questions and go on from there. So if this emphasis on takeaways limits a math lesson, it can render an English lesson existentially absurd. And so we'll now jump from algebra to Hamlet. <laughs> so now back to eighth grade again, and let's imagine that students are approaching Hamlet by reading Polonius's monologue, his speech to Laertes, his son, who's about to go off to France. And they're going to read this. This is the famous monologue. It's the wording varies from edition to, to edition. Uh, but basically, my blessing with you and these few precepts in thy memory, see thou character. See thou character does not mean, by the way, pay attention to character. It means inscribe. See that you inscribe these precepts in your memory. In other words, memorize what I'm about to tell you. And Polonius gives Laertes a long string of advice, basically about how to be calculating in all his actions. And then he ends up, this above all, to thine own self be true, and it will follow as the night the day. Thou canst not then be false to any man. And so <laughs> there are a lot of contradictions, interesting things here. But this is how a typical lesson series would run. And this is hypothetical. It's made up, but it resembles a lot of actual lessons out there published on the internet. Okay, Day one. Students receive slips of paper, each with a piece of advice on it. And they respond in writing to this advice. Do I like it? How do I feel about it? Would I take this advice? Why or why not? Is it good advice? Why or why not? Then they come together in groups to discuss their findings. And they create a rating system for advice, a rubric with points and so forth and criteria, how you, how you would uh, evaluate a piece of advice. Very nice. Then the next day they come together and they read an article, because nonfiction is good, right? And they, they read an article called The Art of Giving and Receiving Advice uh, by David Garvin and Joshua Margolis, and it's published in the Harvard Business Review. It's a long article, but it has many headings, so they can derive takeaways from it very easily. And then they compare it to their rubric and decide whether or not there's anything they'd like to add to their rubric, giving appropriate credit, of course. And they revise their rubric, write it on chart paper, and post it on the wall, because that's evidence of learning. Then the next day, <laughs> um, the next day, they be actually begin with the Shakespeare. And what they do is they read it individually, and they chunk up the pieces of advice into individual pieces. And then they paraphrase the pieces of advice in their own words. Uh, if they didn't do it accurately, that's OK, because you know, this is student driven and so forth. They come into their groups. And they look at their paraphrasings, and they choose the one they like best, and they create a chart of advice and paraphrases. And then the next day, they actually evaluate Polonius's advice using their rubric, which they generated a few days ago. This is so exciting, because they're going to have so many takeaways from this. So they've got their rubric. <laughs> they've got their chart of advice. And now they've given it a rating, each piece of advice individually, and then a, a final full rating and a rationale, which they present to the class. And then the final day, the crowning achievement, they create an advice manual with a quote from the Shakespeare and a quote from the article. And in this manner, five lessons go by, and so does the Shakespeare. Because at no point do they look at the intrinsic qualities of this monologue, the contradictions. You know, here, Polonius has been telling Laertes to be measured, to do everything with caution, never to go too far in this way or that. And then he says, to thine own self be true. It's as though he can't even be true to what he said a few seconds ago. But but it would be wrong to write Polonius off as a fool or a fake because there is one point where he mentions clothing and you know just to be careful with clothing, not you know not overdo it and pay attention. The French are experts in matters of style and so on. So he actually is thinking about his son going to France and what that might mean. 
he's not completely reciting a canned list of maxims, but there's a lot of that in there. So the, in exploring these contradictions and these subtleties, students then will raise questions that extend outward into the play, questions about reflection, questions about the nature of honesty, and so on. And that will enrich their reading when they do read the whole play. But the problem with that is a lesson that took that approach would be short on those takeaways, and it would be short on those products that can be so easily posted around the room. And a teacher who taught in that manner could easily be fought, faulted for conducting a lesson in a way that was too teacher-driven, with a teacher leading the discussion, posing the questions, and so forth. So there you go. So we have... Uh, we can see through these examples that this emphasis on takeaways actually constricts the subject matter. So far I've talked only about education, but how does this apply to life on the outside? How does our emphasis on takeaways affect us? So just as the students were asked to rate Polonius, rate his monologue, so we are asked to rate just about everything we do from a doctor's appointment to a meal to play. Every experience, we're asked to give it some kind of review or rating. And this can constrict the experience itself. There's so much that one doesn't want to put into words right away. Uh, recently, I went to see a wonderful play before it went on Broadway. And the very next day, I received an email asking me to fill out a survey, which was partly a review. And I wanted to help, and I wanted to do it. So I did it. I filled it out. But I, I had a lot of trouble with it because I loved the play, because, I, because I, I wanted to give it some time, and I found that by reviewing it so soon, by putting my thoughts so quickly into words, I had actually shortchanged the experience for myself. I would have liked to carry it around in my mind for a while longer. Ironically, the play was the humans, and there was something mildly inhuman about reviewing it <laughs> so soon. Later, when I went to see Nathan the Wise, I was a little bit wiser. And when they sent me a request for a review the very next day, I wrote that it was wonderful, but I didn't want to put it in words just yet. But anyway, so but we're asked for that again and again. And why did I do it? I didn't have to fill out that review, but I had turned down so many that week. I deleted so many requests for ratings. I thought I should just pitch in once. And I'm a little bit sorry that I did. Uh, and just as we're expected to give ratings, we're also expected to give advice, to have answers to every question, to have a, a solution, to have something specific to do. So when my book, Republic of Noise, came out, I was criticized uh, by some for not telling teachers exactly what to do in the classroom. You know, and that wasn't the point of the book. It wasn't a how-to book. And people ask me, well, what do you expect teachers to do with this? And I said, well, the same thing I would expect anybody to do, read it if they like, and think about it. And I got the most puzzled stares, the most... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, it's odd because for a country that values liberty, we're so fond of mandates and step-by-step -step instructions. But now the point here is not that we should do away with takeaways. Okay? That's not the takeaway here. Students, <laughs> students do need concrete learning. Right? Writers need clear language. We all need summaries and answers at times. It all matters, it, everything depends on what we do with those summaries and answers. If they are the full stop, the end goal, the reason for coming here, then we might as well box up life itself. If, however, they open up into questions and beginnings, that's a much better state of things. Now, but this is not easy. It's, it's easy to make fun of an imaginary lesson plan. It's much more difficult to find fault with one's own work, one's own teaching. And again and again, as a teacher of philosophy at the high school level, I, I see something in a text or in an idea that, that I hadn't recognized before and didn't bring up in the lesson. And sometimes I find out that I was flat out wrong, just made a mistake, wrong. And what do you do in those situations? I could crawl under a table, which is not a good idea in the classroom. Uh, and one, one of my very favorite writers, Nikolai Gogol, would do that. He'd come to class with a kerchief wrapped around his head and he'd be moaning, just sitting down and moaning the whole time. And I, I would not do that, but sometimes I understand the feeling, you know, the, the, the mistakes are embarrassing and one wishes they would go away, but the greater danger is imagining that they have, in fact, vanished. We're wrong again and again, not only about texts, not only about problems, but about people. How often do we reduce people to takeaways? How often do we say that someone is just this or just that, just a liar, just an opportunist, and in doing this, we do great damage? You know, it's, it's convenient to write people off. 
but there is an inconvenience that's essential to life. There's an inconvenience that's essential to art and science and kindness. This is the inconvenience of following the inkling that there's more to a text, a problem, a person than we have recognized before. This requires dropping false answers, but that's the point. There's no greater empty handedness than this. Or if there is, it's well worth seeking out. Thank you.